Advisory Committee. Uh, thank you for coming to this, um, this iteration of State of the Net West, hosted in collaboration with Santa Clara University Law School, the High Tech Law Institute here. Um, I want to thank uh, uh, Joy Peacock and, and Eric Goldman and, and Doris for putting this all together. I really appreciate it. Um, we're a small organization in Washington, D.C., and it's really hard to have a West Coast presence, which we don't, so we're glad to have great partners like uh, Santa Clara. Um, today, uh, this is um, the third, fourth um, iteration of State of the Net West. We tried to do these technology town hall meetings in August and September, uh, trying to have uh, leaders in the Congressional Internet Caucus, the Congressional Internet Caucus converse with leaders in Silicon Valley and, and academics as well. So um, the idea is to kind of bridge that conversation, and we're, we're very successful here. We're very, very happy with how it's going. Um, this is a prelude to our State of the Net conference, which is in January, uh, January 17th and 18th. It's the largest information technology policy conference in the country. Uh, you're all invited, um, so let me know if you want to come. We'll be happy to, uh, to coordinate that with you. Um, today, um, uh, we have, uh, to start things off, uh, emceeing uh, this particular session, Declan McCullough. Um, Declan is a political, political, chief political correspondent for CNET, which is a division of uh, CBS. Declan, and I don't want to date him, goes back a very long time in regards to internet policy. Uh, certainly well before me, um, between 1998 and 2002, Declan was uh, the chief, the bureau chief of Wired, Wired News, and, and he has done everything with regards to internet policy over the past uh, 15 years. So we're really glad to have him MC this. Uh, he's an uh, avid motorcyclist, and he's an accomplished photographer as well. So a man of many talents. Um, Declan, if you can start us off, please. survival of free speech. They are important. So as we 
are now in an economy that is based in large part on intellectual property. The contours on this debate will determine the map of 21st century US-based prosperity. And my firm belief is that the internet has thrived due to free market principles and conservative values and not in spite of them. And we should continue with that limited government pro-innovation solution, especially now that the US is facing 9% unemployment rates uh, we can't afford new regulations that are going to stifle innovators. As Congress debates the issues of data, security, and privacy, I was so pleased to come here and visit with you because of the work that is being done here, and much of it is data-driven. The private sector relies heavily on data for testing, improving, growing, and originating new products and services. There is tremendous creative value in the use and the interpretation of data to help us innovate, job create, and improve our economic fate in this nation. The data is in some ways the lifeblood of the internet. I think that you could say the DNA of data is powerful. It is very powerful in today's economy. We're seeing incredible innovation where the new technologies can extract and apply the DNA of data for exciting commercial purposes. Healthcare informatics, which there's a lot of that around uh, my area in Middle Tennessee, uh, they can now anonymously enter help staffs into a program and use algorithms to help forestall bad outcomes and to help forecast disease trends or even to predict epidemics. Tomorrow's data revolution has the potential to be our next great industrial transformation. And that is why this discussion is so consequential. Think about this. Your generation faces a new frontier. That frontier is data. Are you going to explore it, protect it, learn to commercialize it, respect it, or will you restrict it? And that is for you all to decide. I want to make certain that we respect it and that we protect it and use it. I want my children and grandchildren to be able to experience the full benefits of a pro-data digital economy. To better understand all viewpoints on this issue, uh, as Declan said, we've been active in this. We've held round table discussions in New York I had a roundtable event in D.C. last month. Josh Lynch, who is our legislative assistant handling these telecommunications issues, is here with me today. Last week, he was with us when we did a forum with the Online Publishers Association. Let me relate to you some of the things that we have heard in this series of sessions and forums that we have had about data security, data management, and consumer data protection issues. We've learned that securing the prosperity of our digital economy and ensuring the protection of consumers' most sensitive and private information, or what I like to call the virtual you, is something that every single stakeholder cares about. The virtual you includes a web of things like your online shopping habits, your browsing preferences, and your social interactions. It is the embodiment of your presence online. Of course, that web of interconnected data is constantly growing and constantly changing as new opportunities open up on the web. On one hand, it's exciting because of the possibilities it unleashes for our economic future at the same time. It causes some people to take pause because we're witnessing the proliferation of privacy concerns and online data theft. Both government and industry have a mutual vested interest in seeing the virtual you grow and enjoy the protections that have been afforded in the brick and mortar world in those relationships. However, I offer a word of caution. Consumer trust in online information collection and data management has eroded. We hear this all the time in committee testimony and in our town hall meetings.
consumer confidence is dangerously close to a tipping point. That tipping point will lead to uncertainty that could suffocate the growth and innovation that we have all come to expect online. We must avoid that uncertainty, and uncertainty has come up many times in our forums, because just as we have seen with the healthcare and financial service industries, when we fail to lead with solutions that are pro-business or pro-market solutions, then bureaucracy and big government rush in, and generally you don't like what is left in their way. Here's what usually happens. Government solutions to online privacy concerns evolve either from the left in the form of hyper-regulation from a menu of agencies or from a classical liberalism perspective that defines private information as property. The concern is for solutions being spurred from the action by shrewd activists and morning headlines and not by careful and thoughtful consideration of the facts of the marketplace. An example is the FCC's so-called net neutrality decision. That was a hyperactive, counterproductive example of what happens when government thinks it finds a problem, it feels the urgent need to fix in case someday it does become a problem. What all stakeholders need to understand is that the federal government loves to fill a vacuum. And it does that in a powerful way. They are a broker that has no problem picking winners and losers in that field vacuum. For the online world to continue to thrive, we need real leadership that answers consumers' desire for certainty. That's why we need industry leaders to move swiftly to find a workable solution to the challenges that our online consumers face. We need to give them a credible level of transparency and at least a fighting chance to protect their personal identifying information or their sensitive data. We must do this if we hope to sustain a healthy and thriving creative economy. Government's role here is not to try to keep up with the changes in technology. Washington's view of digital privacy is too subjective. That is why industry must proactively and credibly ensure that individuals know more about what data is being collected about them and how that data is being used. My core message, my warning to everyone today is to empower consumers before the government empowers itself. Something else that we've heard. The first step should be to move data regulation under one roof and to level the privacy playing field for consumers and for covered entities. Whatever consumers deserve, they deserve consistent and transparent protection no matter what technology platforms they might use at any given time. We know those are going to change and those are going to expand. Consumers' digital fingerprints should be guarded equally across the technology spectrum. Our current dual structure of both FCC and FTC jurisdiction only serves to blur the lines of protection. If we defragment government's jurisdiction in this arena, we give consumers the clarity, the certainty, and the consistency that they are looking for. The FTC has the experience and the expertise in this arena, and therefore, this is an area where they should have the jurisdiction. And we know that if you move forward and you identify potential harm to market competition in order to further consolidate the power, then sometimes that's not a good foundation for a workable privacy regime. If interested participants fail to voluntarily enter into a credible structure of self-governance in this new information age, the FCC will, in all likelihood, broadly define regulatory structures basically out of thin air. Under the thumb of the FCC, no safe harbor provisions will exist, and no entity doing business online will avoid the frustration, the layers of unanticipated bureaucracy, and the heavy costs that are generally associated with the items that the FCC moves itself in toward. 
Everyone across the data supply chain should be responsible, number one, for safeguarding what they know, and number two, for what they can control. The total responsibility should not be placed alone on the consumer-facing entity. Balancing the individual's desire to control his or her own information, which we hear a lot in the testimonies in town halls, and the economy's drive toward greater efficiency as possible, but not if Washington, but not if industry and Washington's <coughs> only solution is to ignore the problem and start to build firewalls. An overly expensive privacy regulation for the internet would block consumers and competitors access to the e-commerce marketplace. That's why policymakers need to encourage flexibility in their approach. It's why the industry should lead in establishing best practices, and it's why regulators should and must provide clarity and consistency in the work that they do. Government should default to the do no harm standard and focus its current enforcement authority on tailored solutions that are specific to needed instances. When Washington does propose new regulations, these rules must force on addressing clear, identifiable harms. Obviously, sensitive health stamps, account identifiers, and financial records need to be protected, and some laws are already in place for governments on these. The key is to give consumers the confidence that they are seeking. Online consumers want the assurance that their information is not going to be stolen and that it is not going to be abridged. Finally, and maybe most importantly, Washington must lead by example. What is frightening, and we've heard this in our forums and roundtables, is the scope of data the government holds and controls about private citizens. We need to rethink our framework for government's collection, retention, and storage of individual information. We must do this because the federal government should be leading by example. A pro-market vision to these issues assumes the imperfection of mankind and a preference for markets, not politics, to drive the outcomes. I would suggest that if politicians were ineffective at engineering society before the digital age, that they might not be the best at keeping pace in this new data-driven era. Those of us in this room represent the creative economy. You lead in providing innovative solutions to the world's biggest tech problems. Online privacy and data security issues stretch beyond time and location, but a pro-business approach that returns to the time-tested business adage that the customer is always right just might be a prudent starting point in this discussion. Instituting a solution that respects all people in the digital space would foster and harmonize our industry for another generation. It's time for the leaders of the creative economy to come together to provide some good, solid creative solutions and for Washington to let the Silicon Valley do what it does best, innovate and inspire. Thank you so much for the invitation to join you today. presume to speak for a company in the private sector. But what we have seen is the growth of the federal bureaucracy 
in so many sectors of our nation's economy. And people are beginning to talk more and more about that overreach of regulation and the impact that it has. And it doesn't matter if it's healthcare, if it's education, if it is financial services, if it is any number, uh, the automotive industry, they talk about the impact of this regulation. Many companies are saying, look, we want some certainty. We want to know what we're dealing with for a longer period of time because it's difficult for us to develop a business model that is going to be relevant five years if the rules and regulations keep changing every six months. And more often, um, we are hearing that we are hearing the private sector say certainty would be <coughs> nice, but in that certainty, we sure would like it if you're rolling back regulations instead of adding new regulations. And so, I, I, your perspective on, on privacy is, uh, I, I think, um, uh, unique. I, um, a lot of other members of Congress haven't taken the time to look into the topic as much. And, um, uh, 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 so, uh, another question would be, I, I suspect that the Republican one guns uh, who are out here on Facebook on Monday, um, uh, including Mr. Ryan, Mr. Kent, might agree with you, but you can help. When the Republicans um, uh, were in control of Congress last time around, uh, we saw laws like the Clean Online Predators Act, which would restrict Amazon slash uh, social networking sites uh, that would use your profiles from computers at uh, schools and libraries. There was an anti-spyware bill that the companies out here opposed, and these things were getting floor votes. Um, uh, has something changed? Can you get your Republican colleagues on board this time around? I, I think that what we are seeing, I don't know if I would say if anything has changed, I think there is an awareness that the 21st century economy, much of the transactional end of the 21st century economy is going to be conducted online. Look at the business models that existed for brick and mortar businesses. Look at the relationships that were there in those businesses. Now, I imagine if you were to think about uh, businesses that you have interacted with over a given period of time, uh, you may now see many of those businesses having become click and mortar businesses. And maybe if it's a small business entity, the next generation of that family is looking at moving away from a brick and mortar establishment and into a virtual marketplace template. So as our economy has changed, we need to be looking at what has existed what have the best practices been in the brick and mortar world? And then how do you make that transition into a virtual marketplace? How do you take those lessons that were learned in one and apply them to another? Where do those areas of sensitivity need to be? Customers are also beginning to say, as they conduct more transactions online, then they are beginning to say, hey, look, we want to understand these privacy notifications. You know, it's not unusual now for me to go to a town hall and have someone who is um, an older, maybe a senior citizen, come in and talk about running a blog, talk about the amount of activity that they conduct online, and talk about how they use this as a resource. So what customers are beginning to say is, hey, how can I set those firewalls? So I don't know if it is so much that things are changing um, from that perspective as much as it is an awareness that this is a large component of the transactional activity of the American public. Let's open up to questions from the audience. I suspect that some of you might have uh, uh, something you want to say. To Tim, uh, I believe, has a microphone. Sorry to spring this this on you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> to facilitate the growth of more startups and more small net businesses? Sorry, is that your name and affiliation? Oh, um, Jay with Engine Advocacy. Okay. Uh, what can the government do to facilitate the growth of more startups? Probably, um, the more the government gets out of the way, 
the better it is going to be. And we hear this from entrepreneurs from coast to coast. Uh, there are tremendous concerns about what kind of regulations you have to do. You all will hear from the entrepreneurs that are around you every day about Sarbanes-Oxley, which is a law in the financial services sector and about Section 404 and the compliance in that. And if you think you're going to grow to be big, then uh, having to comply with it, there is currently legislation that would exempt companies with, um, I, I think, a market value of 500 million or less from that legislation. We hear from entrepreneurs that that type compliance is very costly, not from only dollars and cents, but it is costly because of lost opportunity. And there is an awareness of that. Uh, dealing with the agencies, and let me give you another example of where they're saying we would like certainty, clarity, consistency, and we would like for government to kind of get out of the way. I was speaking with some um, individuals that are doing some work with um, a university system and they're working on something in health informatics. And they said, oh, if you look at the net neutrality uh, issue and you look at paragraph 84, then are we going to have to go file with the FCC and the FDA and then the FTC? And it is of concern to me that innovators are beginning to think, oh my goodness, which of the alphabet soup of agencies do I have to go to first, rather than just being out there coming up with the next great idea. I believe in the power of the idea, and I believe in the opportunity of innovators to assemble those great ideas and then work it through development, seek a pathway to commercialization, and move it to the market. Question over here before I do uh, public service announcement. The Twitter hashtag is pound SOTN. So if anyone's tweeting, uh, use that hashtag, please. Yeah, hi, Lewis Traeger with Tom Daly. Um, if you um, at least listen with half an ear to the FTC, uh, FTC's dealings with industry on online advertising, you might get the impression that they're a little bit like a parent in Berkeley trying to discipline a teenage child by saying every few months, if you don't stop doing this, you're really going to regret it, and uh, nothing ever happens, so the child keeps doing whatever they want. Uh, they, uh, with, without regard to how good that analogy is, my impression is that the FTCs uh, will, uh, will say at one point, you better get your act together and start giving consumers real privacy protections, or we're going to have to step in and regulate. And this happens over and over and over again. And, uh, and uh, the, um, the industry response is, is taken by a wide variety of people as totally inadequate. And the FTC says the same thing again. And um, I'm not going to say nothing ever happens or won't happen. But, but how, is that a misimpression? And if, if there's any truth to that, how does that fit into your view of the world? Well, I, and it's a, it's a great question. I, I think that. There are a couple of things there that I'll, I'll point out. Number one, this is the opportunity for the industry to step forward and begin to take the lead and to say, here are our best practices. Um, I have followed somewhat online advertising's approach that they're taking to do the icon in ads that will help identify online advertisers online advertisers that didn't roll off my tongue quite right, that are good actors. I think that that is going to be helpful to consumers because that's the kind of clarity that they're wanting to see. And as they move more of their transactional life online, they want to know that this is somebody they can depend on to be a reputable um, vendor. They can also depend on that person to protect their PII. And they want to know that that type protection is going to be there because they like the opportunity to get online and do their research and do their 
um, their browsing and they, they like to have that type of protection. Now, also uh, being able to identify the good actors helps when you move over and look at how do you root out rogue websites and deal with piracy by having that icon that is going to help to delineate your good actors is going to be an additional help that is there. I uh, would encourage, as I have said in my prepared remarks, I encourage the industry to continue to step forward and to lay forward these best practices. And much as the Better Business Bureau and different entities did during the brick and mortar uh, world or currently do in the brick and mortar world, take that application and use it in the virtual world so that it is the bad actors that get pushed over to the FTC for uh, further action. If I, could just, if I could just follow up. Sure. Why, why is it now the industry's opportunity when you're saying that we're close to a tipping point of some kind of disaster in consumer confidence? This issue has been around for years. People have been complaining about this for years. Why, from your, how does it fit into your worldview that the industry has not stepped forward with the best practices you're hopeful about years ago and put this issue to rest so that we're not at this crisis point? I wouldn't say that it is a crisis point. I do think that consumer confidence is at a uh, tipping point, but I don't disagree with you. The issue has been around, and I think before, Congress moves forward with additional legislation. It is time for the industry to say, this is, uh, these are our recommendations for best practices, and this is a way that we can move forward to give